The Olympics represent the next big moment for women's basketball in a year that's had plenty of big moments for the sport already. We're delving into that and also exploring what EA College Football 25 means for the past and present of NIL. Plus, the U.S. men's basketball team narrowly escaped a massive upset, and Team USA has some very expensive outfits. It's Monday, July 22nd. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. joined now by Lindsay Schnell, Enterprise Reporter at USA Today Sports. Welcome, Lindsay. Hello. Thank you for having me. Great to have you on. So let's start with the WNB All-Star Game, which pitted the uh, the Olympic team um, that's about to head to Paris against the, the rest of the WNBA All-Stars. The non-Olympic team won. Any reactions to the game itself or the scene around it? I thought the scene was incredible. I think that the All-Star Game gets better and better every year. I think it's fun to see an All-Star Game with stakes. Um, These teams were both playing really hard. And I think Cheryl Reeve, the Olympic coach, summed it up perfectly when she said, it's a good thing we don't have to play Arike uh, during the Olympics (laughs) because Arike Agumbawale dominated that All-Star Game. I mean, her second half performance was incredible. Yeah, and it just goes to show that there's a lot of talent in this league. It's not like, yeah, there's a a dozen good players and, you know, everyone else is just kind of there. It's, you know, this, this league runs pretty deep right now. Yeah, no kidding, which is great, right? And you have to remember, we're missing a few players, too. There's a few Olympians from other countries who did, decided to not play this season. So when if they come back after the Olympics, which a lot of people expect them to, that will make the league even stronger. Um, I will say, too, that there's precedent, right? This happened three years ago before they went to Tokyo, and they still took home gold, brought home gold. So maybe things, uh, maybe no one needs to hit the panic button just yet. But it was pretty eye-opening. I mean, the Team WNBA kind of kicked their butt. Stay with the WNBA for a bit. Leagues obviously have a lot more money coming in with its next set of media rights deals, which is are not finalized at this at the time of recording, but very, very close to the finish line. Um, What kind of changes are you expecting for the league? I think the biggest thing is we're going to see a significant bump um, in salaries. It's going to help. Um, Obviously, they're locked into this CBA for a while longer. But when we get the next CBA, uh, they're going to have more money um, to play with, which is going to be huge. I expect even more games to be on ABC. Um, Hopefully, I'm curious about, you know, Kathy Engelbert said we're going to go to a 44 game schedule next season. Right now, that's what the current CBA allows. What is the limit that players ultimately want to hit? You know, my personal dream has always been that the NBA and the WNBA would run at the same time. Um, I understand that that would be a scheduling nightmare, but there are people much smarter than me that have built an algorithm that could figure out how to do it, specifically for cities that both have both teams. But I think that we're just going to see the league get bigger and bigger. And as we do get um, better salaries, one thing that I think will be exciting is we will see more international players come over who are very, very good international players and get more of that international flavor, similar to what we see in the NBA. On that scheduling idea, I'm, I'm curious of what, what the vision is there. Cause, you know, that would also kind of line it up with the college season. It would make a more like comprehensive basketball time in the, the fall and winter what, yeah, what's, um, why would that be a good thing? Because then players would not go overseas. Ultimately, if we get to the point where the WNBA season is running in the winter during what we think of as traditional basketball season, it's happening because there's enough money and there's enough support that that's all players need to do professionally. If they're good enough to play in the WNBA, they don't have to go overseas in the winter. Not all players go overseas in the winter. This Olympic team is unique in that there's quite a few players who choose not to play overseas, but many of them do because many of them need that supplementary income. Diana Taurasi doesn't do it anymore but did it for years. Obviously, we all know Brittany Griner was doing it in Russia when she got arrested. So I think that ultimately what that means is that the WNBA is 
really like a powerhouse league. Sometimes I think the NBA does not treat them like that. And things are complicated because the NBA owns the WNBA. So I think that ultimately playing in the winter and players have said that is the ultimate goal. Also, they would like to play during regular basketball season. Um, And I think that it would help with TV too. I think the summer is challenging sometimes because people want to do a lot, a lot of things in the summer. There's a team coming to San Francisco next year, Toronto the year after that. Do you think the league keeps adding from there? Yes. Kathy Engelbert has said that she wants 16 teams by 2028. As a Portland resident, I really want us to get a team. I'm, you know, my home team right now. When I when I need to go talk to players, I got to drive to Seattle. Personally, I would love for Portland to get a team. Um, yeah, I think they're going to keep expanding. So I think once they get to 16, that will be um, like a good barometer to figure out how quickly they can expand beyond that. And I think, you know, when the league was bigger, they're just in women's basketball, but we're really seeing this flood of interest and investment. The media deal is proof of that, even though I am a little disappointed they're going to sign this really long media deal. I'm not sure that that's smart because isn't the league going to be worth a lot more in just five years, let alone 10. But I think that we're in a really good place. And I also think that the NWSL continuing to expand is pushing the WNBA in a positive way. Yeah. And just on that that general point, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how the league has been doing, how Commissioner Engelbert's been doing with the overall growth. I mean, it just feels like one success after another. Um, Is it as simple as that for you? I've been disappointed. I think it's pretty slow. I think that the NWSL has come in and um, pushed the WNBA. They're forcing them to get better, which is a good thing. I've talked to players about this. You know, the fact that the W is chartering now is going to push the NWSL to get to that point. Um, The NWSL has a much different salary scale, um, but they have players who are making, they have a handful of players who are making huge salaries. We need to see that in the W. So I've been a little frustrated, like there has been all this momentum with women's sports and women's basketball in particular, and I wonder if the W is really capitalizing on it. I think we're going to know a lot going into this off season because we're going to have a lot of rookies that don't go overseas. So how much do we see them? How much bigger a brand do they build when they come into their sophomore year in the league? Um, but I just, I mean, we've been at 12 teams for a really long time. And the fact that next year they're going to go to 13 instead of 14 is frustrating because there were uh, quite a few people who dropped the ball in the, in that, but I'm trying to remain optimistic. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. No, it's interesting. Um, You're headed to Paris shortly after this call. Um, The women's U S basketball team has been, I mean, it was one of the most dominant Olympic dominant, Olympic teams in all of the Olympics. The last time they lost a game was in 1992. Um, What are you, oh, they've won the last four FIBA World Cups. What are you expecting in Paris? I do expect them to bring home the gold medal, but I do think that it's going to be challenging. I think we saw that last night um, with the WNBA All-Star game that it's not roll out the ball and they walk on the floor and they win gold. Um, There are going to be a lot of teams that push them. It took them a tip in at the buzzer to beat Belgium in the Olympic qualifying tournament. The Americans had already qualified, but they played in it anyway. Belgium is in their group play in their group and during pool play that's being played in Lille, which is on the Northern border of France, right next to Belgium. Uh, So I expect that crowd to be very anti us. Asia Wilson told me if she learned anything at the Tokyo Olympics, it's that no one likes the American women's basketball team. Um, I do think too, that, you know, some of the most important players on that team have been beat up. Chelsea Gray missed a good chunk of the season. Nafisa Collier only played three minutes against the All-Stars and has had um, some injury problems flare up. And there has been so much talk around should Caitlin Clark have made the Olympic team, they're going to struggle to escape those questions if they don't play well in Paris. Yeah, and, you know, dynasties eventually end. We sort of saw this on the, the soccer side where, you know, other teams, I mean, it's it's sort of a different thing, given that soccer is like the sport for for most of the rest of the world. Um, But, you know, other countries got got tired of losing, I think, and it's hard to maintain that dominance. And yet, it's also only a handful of games and things can go wrong. But yeah, obviously, they have to be considered the favorites going in. Should be fun to watch. Lindsay Chanel, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Yes, of course. Thank you for having me.
The U.S. men's basketball team also played on Saturday, and this one was not supposed to be close. Team USA faced off against South Sudan as a 43-point favorite. South Sudan is the youngest nation in the world, having been founded in 2011 as the result of a civil war in Sudan. This year, the country is making its first Olympic appearance, and in Saturday's exhibition game came within a single point of one of the biggest upsets in history. Despite South Sudan featuring just two fringe NBA players, the superstar-stacked U.S. team was in trouble for much of the showcase. The African nation led for most of the game by as many as 16 points until Team USA tied things up late in the third quarter. A LeBron James layup with less than 10 seconds in the game put USA up by one, where they held on for the 101-100 victory. Despite the loss on paper for the South Sudanese, this feels like a win for this new program, headed by former NBA star Luol Deng. These two teams will see each other again on July 31st, and what looked like an afterthought when the schedule is made suddenly has all the makings to be appointment TV. Team USA will be outfitted by Ralph Lauren for the opening ceremony of the Paris Olympics, and if you find yourself looking at their outfits and thinking, I would like to wear that stuff, well, you can. It will only cost you $2,514. The priciest item is the blazer, which will set you back $998, but don't discount the jeans and suede shoes, which both cost $398. If you still have more room to spend after dropping $1,800 on those three items, the Oxford shirt costs $325, the belt, which is mostly not visible under the blazer, costs $198, and the tie is $175. The socks are a relatively manageable $22. The overall look, they hope, is priceless. Up next, NAL rules made EA discontinue its college football series a decade ago, and when the series came back last week, it did so with the largest NAL deal in history. I spoke to front office sports reporter Amanda Kristovich about how the game is interwoven into NIL history and what it could mean for the future. That conversation is next. EA College Football 25 is a historic moment for sports gaming, but also for NIL. Joining me now to discuss is front office sports reporter Amanda Kristovich. Welcome, Amanda. Hey, how's it going? Good. Great to have you on. So this may be familiar to some of our listeners, but... Take us through kind of the the history of this game as relates to NIL. Yeah, I mean, I would say that EA Sports College Football and the entire EA Sports College franchise is really a symbol of the athletes' rights movement and the NIL movement specifically. So um, going back 10 years, there used to be, as I'm sure many of our listeners remember, um, an EA Sports college football game and a men's college basketball game. Uh, they did not have their names specifically, but they used like the likenesses and the mannerisms. Like it was very clear, like what players they were portraying, right? Those players, however, did not get paid for their portrayal in the game. And along came a UCLA men's basketball player named Ed O'Bannon, who realized that this was happening and decided to file a lawsuit against the NCAA and EA, basically saying like it was illegal for both of those entities to be profiting in this really popular video game when the players couldn't get a cut. Uh, long story short, basically he won the lawsuit. Um, the judge ruled that it was in fact illegal, but the judge didn't force him or force the NCAA to pay the players they basically just said if you don't want to pay the players no video game so for a decade there was no video game right um and then when and i when the ncaa after a bunch of public pressure legislative pressure um in 2021 changed its rules to allow for nil ea kind of went wait a second we can do the game again like we might be able to do the game so for the past three years they have been um you know there have been a lot of complications, but basically they've put together the football game first and um, it officially launched on Friday. Obviously, the previous Monday, there were some like some people were able to get it early. Um, but yeah, it, after a decade, it's back. And it's really interesting because it's definitely like I would say and some of my sources have also agreed, like the most um, definitely the most popular NIL product and like the most highly anticipated of the entire era so far. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it, right, the game comes back with the biggest NIL deal in history so far. Well, one thing that's still kind of just like, uh, confusing to me, and maybe not other people, is that that gap in the middle before NIL is made legal, um, why doesn't EA just 
release a different version of the game that doesn't have actual players names image and, and likeness like is it so important to them that they had to kind of look like the actual players yeah i think that's a really good question and one that gets to this idea of the value of the players themselves because you know i mean look no one's really come out and said this but like clearly ea didn't see a value or didn't believe the product would be nearly as popular if it were just like basic avatars where like no one in real life was portrayed. And I think that speaks to the power of the athletes themselves and how much um, value their likenesses and their names really lend to college sports in general, right? Like not just the video game. Like yes, EA could have done that. Like legally they could have done that. They obviously didn't see a, a business value in releasing a game without any of the players. And over the past couple of years, there's been, you know, some complications and, you know, it's just been very, it, it's been very complex to try to get all these thousands of FBS football players into the game, right? And some people were saying, oh, just release it without them, right? And then they're like the, the bootleg kind of people who make the names and the players likenesses that you can like plug into the game. But EA didn't see the value in that. They know that in order to get a lot of people to really want this game the players have to be in it i i know like nil is a big complicated subject that you know has a lot of positive effects you know a lot of challenges for the schools this kind of just seems like a pretty pure win-win like i don't see anyone losing with you know the players get six hundred dollars if they participate they can opt out ea gets a game that is more engaging is that, do you agree basically with that? Yeah, I think the biggest question is, could the players have gotten a better deal? Because as you said, they get $600, a one-time $600 check, plus a copy of the game, which obviously they're all like super excited about. Um, but they're not getting royalties. They're, you know, I think some of them are getting some extra NIL money based on like promotion or if they're on the cover or if they're in advertisements. But there has been a lot of questions raised about whether or not the deal is fair enough, whether they could have gotten a better one, if they had a union, for example, which the NCA still prohibits. Um, you know, but interestingly enough, like some of the sources that I spoke with for the story I'm writing, I wrote about this, um, they kind of said, look, like, is it the best deal? Maybe not. But like, honestly, we're not sure because the college space, there are so many more players than like in the NFL. There's no union like there is in the NFL. So it's really difficult to draw a direct comparison and say how much better a deal would have been if the circumstances were different. So I think at this point, it's a, you know, it's, it's a good start. Let's put it that way. I mean, it, you, you can see how like individual players, you know, the biggest stars would be worth a lot more than $600 to have in mm -hmm. the game. But we're also talking about, you know, the 10th best player on the 50th most popular school. And, you know, for them, $600 is probably more than they were going to get if everyone were negotiating individually. Right. Um, do you see this? I mean, it, it seems likely that eventually there's going to be some kind of collective bargaining once we figure out how that that part of it's going to look. And there will be, you know, maybe a, a negotiated deal instead of EA saying 600 bucks, take it or leave it. Do you think that's where we're headed toward this? Absolutely. Um, I absolutely think that we're headed towards collective bargaining. I mean, it's going to take a while and it's going to be very complicated. And the way that collective bargaining would work and the way a union would work, I mean, there are a lot of different models that have been proposed, but it's really unclear, especially given the breadth of college sports and even just the breadth of college football what that would look like. Would there be one union? Would there be a union for every team? Like, you know, public versus private school, blah, blah, blah. So it's definitely where we're headed. But I think for something like a group licensing deal, which this is, that spans the entirety of FBS football, I it's going to be difficult to imagine one union representing every single player, if that makes sense. Um, there are people who want that, and of course, it's the model and the pros, but it's it's definitely a little bit of a ways off. Yeah. And anything else you're watching for you sort of as like, you know, I don't even sure like what we're <laughs> what, what does it let me just take that again, actually. Um, 
And, and d- does this whole episode um, point toward, uh, you know, some like future that you're you're looking out for in terms of like how NIL is bargain going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think the whole process has raised the question of who has the right to represent the athletes. I mean, last summer we covered extensively a lawsuit that uh, related about the game and about the companies that were helping EA create these deals for the players. And it's like, who has the power to negotiate on their behalf? Who has their best interest in mind? Who is an unbiased party and who has an ulterior motive? I think those are all big questions in the negotiations of NIL deals going forward, many of which have not been answered yet. Um, But I think it will be interesting to see how, after we find out how well the game has done from a sales perspective, whether or not the payments to the players in future iterations of the game are going to increase commensurate with with that um, value. Yeah, absolutely. Very interesting stuff. Amanda Christovich, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Xander Schauffele won the British Open, taking home $3.1 million, which is the biggest prize in the history of the tournament. He also won the most recent PGA Championship and its $3.3 million top prize. With those victories, Scotty Scheffler's win at the Masters and Bryson DeChambeau's at the U.S. Open, Americans have swept golf's four majors for the first time in 42 years. That's it for today. Make sure you're subscribed wherever you like to listen and throw us a like on YouTube. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.